Hello, friends. My name is Michael Levine. Welcome to another edition of Without Notes. I think that uh, show title really indicates exactly where we're attempting to go today, which is a conversation without notes. It's a conversation I hope that will be meaningful and interesting uh, for you. I, I suspect it will be because our partner for the expedition is a fascinating, brilliant, original, listen to what I just said, original partner. If I were asked, have I ever met someone more original, more fascinating, more intriguing uh, than my guest, Judith Regan, I'd have to answer, I can't recall meeting anyone more fascinating. So it's a real honor, someone I've been trying to get on this show for quite some time. I, uh, I hope you find the conversation as interesting as uh, I have many of my private conversations with her. Judith, welcome. Thank welcome you, Michael. Balance. What a great introduction. Well, it's Now all, I have to live up to you it. You do, you do. <laughs> and uh, that's not a problem for you. But I'd like to uh, begin by asking how you became who you became. So let's start with, where were you born? Tell us about your formative years, would you? I was born in the state of Massachusetts. Okay. I grew up on a farm. I spent okay. my formative years with my Sicilian immigrant grandparents who mm -hmm. lived in the same house. My parents, who were very young, they're still alive and kicking wow. in their 90s. 90s. Um, and I had two older brothers and two younger sisters. And so that's a, lot party, of people a party of five. Right there. Yeah. And then uh, I also had an uncle who was severely disabled. And uh, he lived in the house. And it was kind of a motley crew, a mm -hmm. tiny little house. I shared a room with my brothers first. Mm -hmm. Then shared a room with my sisters when they came along. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my own room for about five minutes until my mother decided to throw everything out the window because I didn't keep it straight. <laughs> Disciplined household. <laughs> yeah, my mother was tough. My father was a sweetheart. Uh, my mother ruled the roost, and my father was kind of quiet and bookish and sensitive and sweet. And what did he do for a living? He, they were both teachers. Teachers. And... Um, and I had a very interesting start on the planet. Cause yes, you did. My grandmother, who was a Sicilian immigrant, didn't speak English, couldn't wow. read or write. I taught her how to write her name when she was five. She grew up at a time in Sicily when the women wore veils in the <laughs> center of Sicily. And she was born in the 1800s. She had my mother in her 40s. And they didn't even have schools in the little town that she came from. So when I saw the film Roma, <laughs> it was a lot like Grandma. It, it, it uh, reminded you there of was... my grandmother, who was quite a remarkable woman. Nine children, strong, giving, generous, kind-hearted, bright, but not formally educated, and was and has been the major inspiration in my life. Well, that's interesting because inspirations really do play roles in later life, but. If I had met you in those years, in your elementary school or even high school years, would I have thought of your house at that time as middle class, lower middle class, upper middle class? What would it have felt like to I me? I mean, I think growing up in the 50s, I grew up in the 50s, uh, yeah. we were probably considered just about middle class. Middle class. Uh, I mean, we lived on the other side of the tracks mm -hmm. in the town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there wasn't a lot of money. School teachers didn't make much money. At the time, my mother wasn't working. School when, teachers still don't make a lot no, of money. Right? No, and they made very little money back then. And my mother wasn't working until actually I was out of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father supported seven people and wow. not a lot of money. And my mother knew how to stretch a penny <laughs> she true. still does. Still does. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, so. And went to yeah. high school. 
I went to high school in on Long Island. Mm -hmm. We moved to Long Island. And why? And why school. did that? Why did the family move? Uh, I think they moved because at the time teachers made more money on Long Island, on Long and Island. I think they didn't factor in it was more expensive to live there. And in Massachusetts, they had a big extended family and people who helped. And mm -hmm. you know, it really was kind of a big shift in our family. Oh, it's to, huge! What? What? When? You know, what age were you? When so you I was were? ten. Um, you know, left behind my grandparents, my aunts and uncles and cousins. And, and actually, it, you know, I considered it a pivotal moment in American history because I think a lot of what happened in America and the breakup of families and communities, I saw what it was like to grow up in a real community with extended family members, with people who cared, with a small enough town where there was a sense of community and to have that fractured. So, and I grew up without a television. You did? I did. So I had what I call a 19th century childhood. No, no television, television, a big family, on a farm, everyone took care of everyone else, the people who were disabled, they fit in, the ones who were eccentric, they fit in, there was a sense of generosity and community and everybody shared everything. And this is a far cry from where we are today in the culture. Yeah. And this a is an cry. important point that I, I want the audience to hear from Judith, which is, in that world, if you were a neighbor's son or daughter, mm -hmm. and you were walking home a little later than normal, oh, yeah. it would have not been uncommon for a neighbor to say, where are you going? Right. Why aren't you home yet? Right, and call your mother. And call your mother. <laughs> Today, if somebody were walking home at a different time, they wouldn't say a thing because they'd be afraid of being sued. Right. Talk about the war that, that time. That, that was a very different America. I know totally, that America. I know you do. It was a totally different time. It was a time where people felt safe. They felt as if they belong to something. And having a sense of community is really what people need. Mm -hmm. You know, to be healthy, happy, fulfilled human beings. We don't really need a lot of money. We don't need a lot of things. We need to have a sense of- A belonging. A belonging and being together and working together and caring for each other and being part of a community. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's really lost in America and why we have so many problems and so mm -hmm. many social problems. So now you're in high school, you're on Long Island, you're going to high school, were you a good student? I was a good student, I was the first female president of my class. I would say first and foremost I was a good student because if I hadn't been my mother would have killed me. So that we'll is, start with that. You, you know, that is so interesting. <laughs> I would have been dead. I still have her in my head. I have been trying for 65 years to get my mother out, out of, of my, my head. Because oh. I still think she's gonna kill me, right? <gasps> So, I mean, there's the good of that and the yeah, bad of, of that, course. right? And I'd say, um, you know, for somebody like me, a naturally resilient, you know, fighting right. spirit That's kind right. of a person, I could survive my mother, yes. right? But for, there are people who are don't people, have... No, and there are, some of my siblings had a harder time surviving my mother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's great to have someone who wants structure and expectations those are all good, and I think limit setting is really great for children. I, you know, I think that, that they have a great benefit to grow up in an environment where things are required of them, where they have to earn things. Which, by but, the way, is not the, the style of the day. Oh, no, there's only entitlement today. Entitlement. You're right. entitled, you don't have to do anything, you just have to feel good. And you get a trophy. And you get a trophy. For, for anything. For not even anything. And <laughs> if for any reason you're not given a trophy. Then you sue people. That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. No, that wouldn't happen in my house. If, I, if somebody did something to me that was harmful and they were unfair, in my mother's mind, it was my fault. No matter what, <laughs> it's your fault. No matter what, you get into a fight with your older brothers, it's your fault. But it didn't matter. So, Judith, I want to understand this is a very important topic regarding the concept of resilience. This, of course, is a quality deeply missing in most contemporary people. Yes. They are 
it's everybody's fault. Often referred fault. to s snowflakes. They, You've yeah. heard the term yeah, snowflake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't so, deal with stuff. But what I want to understand about you from your perspective is the resilience that you clearly have. Was it something that you were born with, something you developed, or who the hell knows? I don't think anybody really knows, and I've thought about this a lot, and I look back on my life and I think the things that I've been through in my life, abusive men, loss of a child, horrible, horrendous 10-year divorce, vicious smear campaigns run against me, lots and lots of things that were, you know, really traumatic, mm -hmm. but why did I do okay each and every time? Actually, to be more fair to the audience, yeah. you didn't do okay. You did very well. You okay. prospered. I did. So there was something in you, and of course the audience listening to you and watching you is fascinated by what is it that she knows that I don't know that I can learn? Okay, number one, I have never been a victim. I don't think of myself as a victim. Even when I was in junior high school, and I mean, every step of the way throughout my life, I can trace my success in overcoming things right back to very early childhood. If I wanted to do something, and they said, well, girls don't do this, which was the thing. Mm -hmm. I very, just much, yeah, very much. Very the much the thing. I just ignored them. Mm -hmm. I didn't turn into, I'm a victim. I'm a, no. I just ignored them and proceeded to do it anyway. And, and by the way, <laughs> I, I think you know I, 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 I do a bit of public speaking, and I think you know that I have said that if a person yearns for whatever reason to be broke, all you have to do is think like a victim, and you yeah. will be broke. I've never been a victim, no matter what. Ever. Ha I've had my face bashed in. I've, I, I've had so many crazy things happen. But you didn't push that button. I get up again, and I go on. And that's the key to life. I think part of it is in my DNA. Part of it is I fight appropriately. I fight back when it's necessary to fight back. I pick my battles. You must pick your battles, absolutely. I absolutely believe that you have to write things that are seriously wrong. I really believe that. But I don't think you have to write every wrong, mm -hmm. okay? And I think that if you live your life thinking that you're a victim, you're gonna have a miserable life. You are going to be broke. You're going to be exhausted. <laughs> you're gonna be You're gonna be tiresome to everyone around you. Right. Okay, so now you're in high school. You're a good student. You clearly have some version of superhuman resiliency. And now we get to, do you go to college? Went to college, went Where to Vassar, go? majored in English. Okay, so now Vassar's a good school. Yeah. How does a young lady uh, from, uh, from a large family with gre not great resource, get herself into Vassar. Well, again... Tell me about that. Okay, so my brother Leo was a student at Yale. He was a few years older. My brother John was a student at Brown. He was a year older, and I was at Vassar all at the same time. We all had scholarships. My mother, you better get all A's. You, I studied now, hard. You, well, I did the work. I, I want to understand because this is often referred to in contemporary life as the Asian home. If an Asian child <laughs> My walks, mother was an Asian woman okay. who was Italian. If you came home <laughs> in the sixth grade with a C oh, no. on your report card. I wouldn't card. go home, because she literally would pummel me. I literally wouldn't go home. When I was in high school, and I was always an overachiever, there were eight periods in the day. One of them was for lunch, one of them was for gym. I took nine classes. Just okay, know. so uh, you know, but try was to that, that but out. was that born of a sense that I don't have privilege, and so therefore I have to work harder? I mean, yes, I I wanted to work harder, I wanted to achieve, but I also liked it. I liked doing things, I liked learning things. I was curious. I was a violinist. I wanted By to the be way, the best violinist, the, right? The reason that I gave you such a lavish introduction, in large part is I would comfortably attest to your deep human curiosity. I have, we have been out to dinner, 
and you're as fascinated by the hat check, <laughs> what the hat check girl is saying, and the waiter, and the and the, yeah. the parking valet. You are. I'm the, interested. You're you're interested, which of course I think in, may explain why you're so interesting. So. Thank you very much for tuning in to episode one. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Now, coming up is episode two, and I promise you, you will not want to miss it. Thank you.